The date is 1994 and two years after the breakup of the Soviet Union. The repercussions of the sudden fall of the Iron Curtain are still rippling across Eastern Europe. In the former nation of Yugoslavia, civil war has broken out and now several factions vie for power, each seeking to carve out an independent nation for themselves. With the UN's backing, NATO has rushed to contain the fighting and aid the streams of refugees fleeing the violence. With all sides in the conflict targeting civilians, the UN approved the creation of a no-fly zone over former Yugoslavia. Unfortunately, the UN stopped short of allowing NATO to enforce the no-fly zone with military force, and for six months NATO E-3 sentry aircraft flew along the perimeter of crumbling Yugoslavia and making note of numerous violations of the no-fly zone. With over 500 violations, NATO at last managed to win a vote by the UN Security Council to use military force to enforce the no-fly zone. Flying from Hungary and skirting the former Yugoslavian border, a NATO E-3 sentry uses its powerful airborne radar to penetrate deep into the no-fly zone and search for targets. All sides in the conflict have been warned that military force has now been authorized, but it's unknown if any of the combatants believe NATO will have the nerve to actually use force. At the same time that the E-3 sentry is conducting its routine patrol, two American F-16s enter the no-fly zone en route to provide air support for UN forces on the ground. Their radars make contact with six unidentified bogies, and after the E-3 sentry repositions itself so the mountainous terrain doesn't block its radar, it's able to confirm the contacts as six Bosnian Serb fighter bombers with two additional attack aircraft in tow. The F-16s immediately issue a land or exit order to the aircraft, warning the pilots to abide by the rules of the no-fly zone and immediately land their aircraft or exit the no-fly zone. The Serb jets ignore the warning and continue to their target as the E-3 sentry vectors in an additional flight of F-16s on their location. To the horror of everyone watching, the Serb aircraft drop bombs over their target, a military factory and adjacent civilian buildings. The intercepting American F-16s are immediately given the go-ahead to engage. Knowing they were under pursuit by the American F-16s, the Serb jets immediately turn back and scream for their base in the north. An American F-16 opens fire with a single AM-120 AMRAAM at long range, and in seconds one of the eight aircraft is in flames and tumbling out of the sky. The remaining aircraft immediately hit the deck, flying at extremely low altitude and dodging and weaving through the mountainous terrain to avoid the American radar. The F-16s follow suit undeterred and press the attack, their afterburners easily catching up with the Serbian Jastreb fighter bombers. The lead F-16, now in close range, fires off a salvo of two AIM-9 Sidewinders and each of them find their mark, sending two more aircraft tumbling out of the sky. The lead F-16 is now low on fuel and out of missiles though, and so he pulls out of the attack and hands the chase over to his wingman, who's been flying top cover above. The second F-16 screams down out of the sky and joins the chase, letting loose with his own sidewinder. The missile detonates a few meters behind the aircraft and shreds the tail section of the Serbian Jastreb, forcing the pilot to try and limp back home before eventually being forced to ditch. Both F-16s are now low on fuel though and are forced to break off the engagement. Unfortunately for the Serbian aircraft, the second flight of American F-16s has now arrived on scene. The second flight is also low on fuel but gives chase, and one of the fighting Falcons manages to drop in behind a Serbian Jastreb and put a sidewinder straight up its tailpipe. The F-16s are forced to break off the attack, leaving the survivors to limp back home, though they will eventually lose five total aircraft to the attack and being chased to low fuel by the American F-16s. The previous scenario was the only combat engagement between NATO aircraft and hostile aircraft operating in the no-fly zone established over the former Yugoslavia during the war that shook the nation back in the early 90s. Historically, no-fly zones were zones of control where a nation's aircraft enforced their sovereignty over said airspace, and thus they've been in effect since the First World War. However, no-fly zones as we know them today are a relatively new development and meant to be used as a peacekeeping tool or to limit civilian casualties in the case of war. Air power allows combatants to bring an incredible destructive power against their enemies, and in many cases against civilians, which are either deliberately targeted or accidentally caught in the crossfire. In order to limit the scope of destruction from a conflict, the international community has at times enforced no-fly zones in combat areas in order to suppress the air power of two rival factions. These no-fly zones are enforced with the goal of keeping civilian casualties as low as possible, or to prevent one military superior faction from strong-arming another. In a more practical sense, for the rest of the world, they also serve to keep civilian aircraft out of a conflict zone, 
and thus keep them safe. No-fly zones will primarily be enforced to keep hostile aircraft grounded, but they can also serve to authorize peacekeeping forces to use their own air power to neutralize ground forces. During the Bosnia War, the NATO-enforced no-fly zone also gave authorization for NATO aircraft to conduct close air support and ground attack missions in support of UN forces on the ground or to eliminate enemy forces targeting civilians. NATO aircraft frequently attacked concentrations of artillery and tanks, aiming to keep these weapons from being used on the civilian population, which was being massacred at the time. After the first Gulf War in Iraq, two separate no-fly zones were enforced by the Allies. One in the north of the country was placed to help prevent attacks on the Kurdish population by Saddam Hussein's regime, which had previously launched poison gas attacks against Kurdish towns. In the south, a no-fly zone was established to protect Iraq's Shia population from retaliation by Hussein for their support of the Allied war against him. In response to the Libyan civil war, a no-fly zone was established in 2011 over the nation with the aim of stopping the helicopter barrel bomb attacks being carried out against the civilian population. These barrel bombs were devastating and killed dozens while injuring many more. But how exactly are no-fly zones enforced? One of the key lessons of the Iraqi no-fly zone is that in order to enforce the no-fly zone, one must have a credible military deterrent that can respond to airspace intrusions. Without Turkey's support for the northern no-fly zone, the Allied countries found it difficult to enforce the no-fly zone, as there were simply no airfields local enough to house military assets that could maintain routine patrols. Thus, the effectiveness of the no-fly zone was questionable, and violations by Iraqi aircraft were frequent. In the south, though, aircraft from Saudi Arabia and U.S. aircraft carriers could easily enforce the no-fly zone. In order to enforce a no-fly zone, the enforcers require the ability to track and then respond to any unauthorized incursions. This means that the enforcers require the use of powerful radar, capable of covering vast swaths of territory at a time. Though ground-based radar can be used for the task, ground-based radar can easily be avoided by extremely low-flying aircraft. Thus, airborne early warning aircraft such as the American E-3 Century are typically used for the task. These aircraft carry powerful onboard radar that can scan hundreds of square miles of airspace at a time, and with their high altitude vantage point, they can be very difficult to hide from. Though, as in our opening scenario, low-flying aircraft using mountainous terrain can still hide from airborne radar if they know the location of the early warning aircraft and simply fly low and behind the cover of terrain. For this reason, it's important that your early warning aircraft be supported by additional units, which can fly patrol routes that minimize the number of blind spots hostile aircraft could hide in. However, this can quickly become expensive, as these aircraft aren't cheap to operate, and thus early warning aircraft typically fly less predictable patrol routes so that hostile aircraft aren't able to consistently use the same routes to avoid being spotted. In addition to an early warning aircraft, you then must have the means to physically enforce the no-fly zone. And this means only one thing fighter support. In order for the no-fly zone to be credible, these fighters must be able to rapidly respond to violations and engage offending aircraft when needed. This means that an enforcer typically has two options. The first option is to maintain routine patrols of the airspace by fighter patrols. This can be expensive though and requires the use of tanker aircraft to support the fighters by providing in-flight refueling. In certain scenarios, this can increase the risk to aircraft by ground forces using anti-air weapons, as tankers are completely defenseless, as are aircraft in the midst of in-flight flight refueling. For this reason, tankers typically operate from the periphery of a no-fly zone, meeting their assigned fighters for a gas up and then returning home. This, however, can also very quickly become very expensive, and unless you have a large pool of available aircraft and pilots, can quickly fatigue both men and equipment. Each hour a fighter aircraft spends in the sky typically means three or more hours of routine maintenance to keep the aircraft operational, and with constant patrols, the costs quickly become astronomical. For this reason, the second and preferred option is to house responding aircraft on air fields, either bordering the no-fly zone or within the no-fly zone itself. This way, once a violation is spotted, an aircraft on alert can quickly take to the air, rather than keeping aircraft constantly in flight and on patrol. This can come with its own risks, though, and an enforcer operating from an airfield must constantly work to secure the airbase's ground footprint. This is an area of territory around the airbase from where the aircraft taking off or landing are vulnerable to ground-based anti-aircraft weapons. Typically, this footprint extends a few miles around the airbase and an additional few miles along the axis of the runway. 
To secure this area, militaries use routine ground patrols or infantry or other security forces. In the end, in order to enforce a no-fly zone, you must have the ability to credibly do so, which includes not just the physical resources but the political will. This was something that the Serbian forces in the Bosnian War did not believe NATO had, and led to the incident in our opening scenario. It's also important to have international support for your no-fly zone, as it's rare that an enforcing nation will have the territory to operate from near a combat zone unless it happens to occur right next door. This was a major problem for NATO forces trying to enforce the no-fly zone over northern Iraq after the first Gulf War, as the lack of Turkish support meant that NATO aircraft couldn't use Turkish territory to enforce the northern Iraqi no-fly zone. Do you think no-fly zones are worth the expense? Tell us in the comments, then watch our other video, Why Does Each U.S. Air Force Pilot Helmet Cost $400,000? As always, if you enjoyed this video, don't forget to like, share, and subscribe for more great content.